closer to you, so you're stuck with me moving closer. I apologize ahead of time, Craig, because I'm really screwing up. <laughs> nope, <laughs> anyway. not at all. Welcome to St. Paul's United Church of Christ this morning. Pentecost Sunday, um, an exciting day for the church, and because of Pentecost, I think the message there is that no matter who you are or where you go on your life's journey, you are welcome. Um, Pentecost sent the disciples out of Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, and we are here because of that movement. So we're grateful for your presence. And I um, just want to let you know that starting next week, we are going to have an 8.30 service as well as the 11 o'clock service. Um, I may insist on everybody sitting in the front row, or we may sit up here a little closer so we're all together for those who choose to come. We'll also be worshiping at 11 as well. It's an experiment for the summer um, to see how that goes. And we've heard people say it might be a little better for the tea times if we met earlier and we'll do that. Um, this is the week when we collect the strength of this church offerings. These bulletins are, or these envelopes are in your bulletin. This is uh, one of the five UCC offerings annually. And it is one that is used entirely for national, within the U.S. Um, efforts to increase um, church leadership, <coughs> to look at new church opportunities and church starts and church plants, and to assist the ministries of our churches. So please, if you have an opportunity and you wish to give, please give to this. And if you don't have money or a checkbook with you and you'd like to give anyhow, Becky would be happy to receive your offering if you want to send it to the church office. Are there any announcements from the congregation? Okay. If not, then I would ask that you would stand for our opening prayer, which we are going to say together. Let us pray together. Spirit, Spirit of, of wind and fire, fire come, come to us this day, day freeing us from our fears. Lift us up when we have fallen. Dust us off and set us squarely on the path to hope you have set before us. Remind us that we are never far from your presence. Get us ready for the great adventure and opportunities that lie before us. Help us to be good and willing workers for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And please remain standing for our opening song, which is number 649. Gather us in six four nine. <laughs> So 
because we've had too much alcohol to drink. This is not because we're crazy. This is because God promised that God was going to pour out in the last days on young men and old men, on young girls and old, old women, not spirit. And that is what we celebrate today. Let's pray. Let's pray with our eyes open and the spirit flowing. It is a pencil. You can keep, you're all welcome to keep these pencils. Dear God, thank you for the children of this church and thank you for Jacob who is so regular here. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who is with us and in us and empowers us to do so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You may be seated. And I invite the choir to come to you. Or no, I'm sorry. I invite the choir to do what they're going to do. Suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthian, Mede, Edomite, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya beyond, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Greek and Arab. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit unto all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy and I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lots of freshly baled hay 
That's kind of the grain offering that in Israel they would have been bringing to the, to the sanctuary, to the tabernacle, to the temple to thank God for. It was also a time when they thanked God for giving the law to Moses. It was a day to recall the powerful, gracious presence of God in life-giving grain and the binding promises between God and God's people through the law. And on the particular Pentecost that we're looking at today, God also provided the Holy Spirit in a more powerful and different way. And that spirit sustains us all the way until and through today. They had been doing this Pentecost thing for about a thousand years, and faithful Jews and Jewish converts from near and far gathered in Jerusalem 50 days after Passover, which was also on this particular year, 50 days after Jesus had been crucified. His followers, Jesus' followers, were in an upper room. They'd seen the resurrected Jesus on numerous occasions. They were also following his instructions to wait in Jerusalem until they had received the Holy Spirit. And following that, to testify about Jesus in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Spreading the word to the world must have seemed impossible. These followers of Jesus had probably never traveled beyond Palestine. They had no idea what to expect. They had no clue exactly when it would happen. And then suddenly, as so often Jesus appeared in the New Testament after his resurrection, and suddenly, as God so often acts, there was a violent howling wind that came up and divided tongues of fire appeared over each of them, and they spontaneously spoke in foreign languages. It was so remarkable and noisy that a crowd of people gathered outside. This was beyond the follower of Jesus' wildest imaginations, and it was just the beginning. On that Pentecost Sunday, uh, the Spirit drove the disciples from the upper room and out to where the people were. If we were going to reenact this appropriately, I would have sent y'all outside with those pencils and the crazy <laughs> because that's what happened on the first on the first Pentecost. Peter, for example, who had been who for fear of being crucified just like Jesus had denied him three times. He had hidden in the upper room even after Jesus was resurrected. And he gave the sermon of a lifetime by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the result, about 3,000 people received salvation, which simply means to enter into a relationship, an intimate relationship with God, 3,000 people from one sermon at 9 o'clock in the morning, one day, 3,000 people added to their number. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit wasn't just something that happened on the day of Pentecost. It's a recurring theme throughout the book of Acts. For example, the Spirit breaks out and sets the church either on a new course or a place to travel to when a new discovery about God and how God makes salvation possible because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. There was another Pentecost experience along the Gaza Road when Philip, who was one of the ones assigned to be a deacon and to serve at the tables, witnessed to an Ethiopian eunuch who then requested and received baptism. Church history tells us that that eunuch took the word of Jesus back to Ethiopia, and Ethiopians claim, and rightfully so, that they are the oldest Christian peoples in the world. Pentecost occurred again when Peter, after being convinced in a vision that nothing God created could be, that God had created clean, could be made 
profane. He went to the home of a Gentile by the name of Cornelius in Caesarea, which was a Roman capital in Judea. He shared the good news, and the Holy Spirit fell on the whole household of Gentiles. A similar thing occurred following a miraculous earthquake that freed Silas and Paul from the jail that they had been placed in. They went, they stayed within the jail, and the jailer who should have, who wanted to fall on his sword because he was afraid he had failed at his work, they witnessed to him about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit fell upon the whole household of the jailer's family. The Spirit would continue to push the disciples from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth, including Woodstock, Virginia. We are living in the season of Pentecost, which is not just a season of the church year, but it is the eternal pouring out of God's Spirit among us. What in the world might that mean to the church today? First of all, together. When the day of Pentecost had come, we are told they were all together in one place. All together, one place. It's like saying they were together, together, together. Being a Christian isn't about being a lone ranger. It's not a solo affair. It is part of being in a, in a covenantal community. We do our best discernment together. We do our best planning and carrying out of plans together. We do our best ministry on a Sunday morning and other days throughout the year together. We do our best mission together. The disciples had devoted the previous 10 days to prayer together. That time of prayer included a business meeting when they chose someone to replace Judas together. No doubt they ate and slept and got supplies and took care of their personal bodily needs, and they did so together in community, attentive and devoted to discerning God's leading together, like we are this morning, together. Second, recurring abundance. Oh, let me unpack that for you. Peter, when quoting the prophet Joel, said this, I, meaning God, will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Will pour out, in the Greek, is a verb that is both present as well as constantly looking forward. We see that in the book of Acts, and we see it from our point of view 2,000 years later, that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit continues. Pour out is a phrase that is used in other places in the Bible, and it is not some kind of like drop by drop by drop sharing in a little tiny mini cup. It is an extravagant, abundant, bestowing liberally it means to spill or to gush out like a spring from the earth or the cup overflowing. It is abundance. And it is also abundant in terms of the recipients. All people on earth. Sons, daughters, young, old, slave and free, Jew and Gentile as Acts and then Paul would reveal for all people. It reminds me, as I was thinking about this, of two different outpourings of the Holy Spirit related to St. Paul that I've gathered over the last four years. Um, following the devastation of the Civil War, a congregation in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a place that had lost plenty of their sons in the battle, as well as the Confederate soldiers, their church building had been destroyed, and nonetheless, they collected and sent an offering 
Here, the St. Paul's Church in Woodstock for rebuilding, for our recovery. That's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit after a time of devastation and war. There was another time in, in more recent history, I wasn't here when it happened, but it was reported to me by Reverend Clara Young, who served here as the interim. And she told me that one of the most remarkable things that happened at St. Paul's and Woodstock